We're going to start a new study today because last Wednesday I made personal history. I finished teaching through every epistle verse by verse in the New Testament. When I finished Philemon, I've been to everyone from Romans through uh, Jew. I've even verse by verse the book of Revelation, which nobody else calls an epistle. Epistles are letters written to churches. I sometimes refer to the book of Revelation as an epistle because John wrote it to the seven pastors of the seven churches that he was writing to. So it was a prophetic epistle, but he was writing it to seven specific churches and specifically to the pastors of those seven churches. Paul's epistles are mostly to churches, a handful of them are to pastors. So the book of Revelation qualifies on both fronts there. Um, but because it's a prophetic letter, we tend to think of it as a book of prophecy. But anyway, I preached uh, verse by verse through that as well. The only thing I haven't preached verse by verse through are the historical books, the four gospels and the book of Acts in the New Testament. And I, uh, I, they're not the kind of books that I would preach verse by verse through. But uh, nonetheless, that was exciting to me to finish it. Now I'm working, uh, before Jason started putting my teaching on YouTube, um, I had finished some epistles that he doesn't have, um, that he never videoed. And so uh, two, three weeks ago on Sunday morning, we started Galatians. And that's one that uh, I've done two or three times in my adult life, but never since he started the YouTube thing. So um, every sermon I teach right now goes on YouTube. Not that same day or week. I, it's usually a couple, two, three weeks late, later, but they all get up on YouTube. And so I started Galatians. Um, now the, that one's gonna take a while. And tonight I'm going to start one that's going to take longer, Hebrews. So Hebrews is 13 chapters. And we're going to start it tonight. Now, you would think we're going to zoom through it, because the first lesson we're going to cover the entire first chapter. Well, there's only 14 verses in the first chapter of Hebrews. And it's a kind of an introduction. And so we're going to get through the entire first chapter, but it's going to take quite a while to get get through it. I might have to find a way to speed it up. When I taught it earlier in 2013, it took um, over a year to finish it uh, because there's so much to say. It's in such an amazing, amazing book. So again, I mentioned I am living in hog heaven right now because I'm going to be teaching Galatians Sunday morning, Hebrews Wednesday night, and I'm writing commentary on Romans. It doesn't get any better than that. So, uh, matter of fact, I finished verse, uh, I believe verse nine this morning in uh, Romans eight. There's 39 verses in that chapter in Romans. But uh, there's 16 chapters. But it's been a great journey and I, I just love it. It's, I just feel like I'm filling up and ready to pop here because uh, I'm, I'm now I'm studying once a week Galatians for a Sunday morning sermon. Once a week, uh, I'm going to be studying Hebrews. And five or six days a week, usually seven, I'm going to be studying Romans. So, uh, I mean, I'm Three just books. filling up, man. <laughs> Loving every bit of it. So, Hebrews, uh, the first thing I'm going to tell you, I don't know if we prayed. Father, as we journey through some of your word tonight, just uh, bless our time in it. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, Hebrews is known as the better than epistle. The better than epistle. And as we get through uh, chapter one here, you'll get a glimpse of why they call it that. Some of the commentaries refer to it as the better than epistle. So, verse 1. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the Father, 
our fathers rather, by the prophet. Now you say, what in the world is, is sundry times and divers manners? So I put it in the New International Version to help you make better sense of it. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophet at many times and in various ways. That's what those expressions are talking about. Uh, many times, the uh, diverse uh, manners would be in various ways, and sundry times would be as many times. So the um, prophets wrote the Old Testament, the, the apostles, I mean, the prophets wrote the Old Testament along. Matter of fact, there are uh, 17 prophetic books, the 12 min uh, minor prophets and the five major prophets. The last 17 books of the Old Testament were written by prophets, specifically. But prophets were involved in the giving of God's word, uh, even when it wasn't an actual prophet writing it. So uh, I believe it's Paul. Again, nobody can say definitely, yes, it's Paul that wrote this, no, it isn't. Uh, I think the majority of evangelical commentators believe it to be Paul. Some are almost definite in their stance, but the problem was, is that every other epistle that Paul wrote, guess what the first word he writes is? Paul. He identifies himself with the very first word. No mention of Paul in this epistle at all. So people say it can't be Paul that wrote it because it's different than everything else he wrote. Others argue, well, certainly Paul's doctrine. Uh, others argue it's not because Paul doesn't use Old Testament teaching on temples and priests and stuff like that to uh, promote the gospel. And so some say that's not Pauline, that's not his type. And I say, wait a minute, he was a Pharisee before he was saved. Who would know that stuff better than Paul? And so there came a time when he decided to write something, even though Paul was an apostle to the Gentiles, if indeed this is Paul, he writes this with the Hebrews in mind, the Jews. And uh, some people think maybe the reason he doesn't start, those who believe Paul wrote it, maybe the reason he doesn't start with his name, it was attached to another epistle. Let's say, I forget which one they suggest, so let me grab one. I'm writing commentary in Romans, that's not the one they suggest, but let, let me uh, pretend it is for a minute. So Paul wrote an epistle to the Romans and started that epistle off with the word Paul, an apostle. If he's already identified himself, and then he wrote this for the um, Hebrew believers or the Jewish believers in, in the Rome, the church at Rome, then he wouldn't have to re-identify himself because if the two were attached, he'd already identified himself one. So that's one of the arguments, but we're not going to settle that tonight. It had never been settled. There are some who are adamant it's not Paul and some who are absolutely adamant it was. So you'll usually hear me say something and in my questions here, what does the writer have in mind? When I talk about Hebrews, I often say, uh, the author says this or whatever, because I'm not quite sure who it is, although I lean toward Paul, but on no solid basis. I'm not a scholar. I don't know all the things these commentaries, uh, uh, these commentators know that have studied every inch of the Bible from every angle. Uh, so I lean to them, but just in my gut, I kind of think it's Paul, but can't, can't know it for sure, so I don't say Paul. So it starts off that the, the, the writer here says um, that in, in the more easily understood, the New International Version, that God used prophets at many times in various ways uh, to speak to the fathers, the Old Testament leaders of the Jewish family, the Abrahams, the Isaacs, the Jacobs, and that sort of thing. So the first question you see, I, I don't say what does Paul have in mind here, I say what did the writer want us to see in the above verse? And he wants us to see that there was a time in time past when God spoke a certain way to his children. He mostly spoke to his children through prophets. 
not only did prophets write some of the books, but when you read the six books of the kings, now that's how some people uh, categorize. There are three con uh, consecutive books in the Old Testament that have a first and second. The first Samuel, second Samuel. First Kings, second Kings. First Chronicles, second Chronicles. Now, uh, first and second Samuel. Uh, Samuel uh, was a prophet. Um, not the ordinary kind of prophet, didn't prophesy a lot of future things, but he was a man of God that always knew the word of the Lord. He's the one who anointed David but to be king. But he wrote first and second Samuel. And following them are first and second Kings and first and second Chronicles, which are telling the same two stories. First and second king, in other words, are telling the stories of the kings of Israel and Judah. And uh, they go through it, they tell the stories a little differently, but because David is introduced uh, as king, there's King Saul in, in um, Samuel's, uh, first, second Samuel, there's King Saul, and then it ends up with King David. Uh, and so they include that and call those six books, first, second Samuel, first, second King, first, and second Chronicles, the six books of the kings. And, um, a lot of history there, a lot of prophets in there. These kings all had prophets. God had prophets around, even the bad kings. The prophets would come in and prophesy, you need to do this, or. So in times past, the writer of Hebrews is saying, God found ways to talk to important people through the prophets, all right? Now look at verse two. That's what he did in times past has in these last days. What last days does the writer of Hebrews have in mind? Not what we think of as last days. We think of the last days as being when the book of Revelation begins to unfold in the world news. Um, that's not what the, the writer of Hebrews has in mind here. Everything changed with the death, burial, well, first the birth, of course, and then the death, burial, and resurrection, and ascension of Christ. Everything changed into a new era. Jewish law was over as it was initially understood, and we have a new system of how to relate to God called the gospel. So the writer here is saying, in these last days, he's spoken unto us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. So the author here is saying, boy, the Old Testament really got some glory. God used prophets to speak to folk. But then he said, oh, wait a minute. The New Testament's better. This is the better than epistle. The New Testament is better. God didn't use prophets giving secondhand messages. You see, first God had to give a message to the prophet. And then when the prophet gave it to the people, it became a secondhand message. That's not, that's not how the New Testament takes place. Jesus comes along and speaks the direct word of Almighty God. Jesus, the prophets are great. Jesus is greater. You see the title I settled on there for this lesson. Prophets are great. Angels are great. Jesus is greater. So he starts off talking about prophets. Listen to what God doesn't say about the prophets in verse 1. He doesn't say what he says about the Son in verse 2. God has appointed the Son to be heir of all things, and then he identified the son as the one who also made the world. Now, in more modern translation, the NIV uh, had it made the universe. The prophets didn't make anything. They just prophesied. God never said about any of those great prophets in the Old Testament, not one of them. He never said, I'm making them heir over everything. He said that about the Son. He never said they made anything. 
He said, Jesus made everything. So, who's greater? This is the greater than epistle. Jesus is greater than the apostle, I mean the prophet. All right? Now, regarding that, the uh, fact that you see I put in bold letters down there, Hebrews is the greater than epistle. Um, I added to this, to amen, what verse the author said in verse 2. I put down what John wrote in his very first chapter of his gospel, verses 1 to 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, verse 14 of that chapter identifies who the Word was. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Made flesh. Not born flesh. He was made flesh. He was born flesh. But it's identifying the Word as Jesus. So when you read the beginning of John, it said in the beginning was the Word. It's in essence saying in the beginning was Jesus. And Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. Now listen to what John, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes. Without him, without Jesus, was not anything made that was made. So up here, the author of Hebrews is saying Jesus made the worlds, or in the more modern translation, the universe. Jesus made the universe. Down here, John gets even more specific. There isn't anything anywhere that's not eternal. That includes everything but God. The only thing that's eternal, backwards, it's God. Jesus created everything that had a beginning. Not just our universe. I'm sure when we get up there, we're going to find it's a lot bigger than our universe. And that's pretty big. So John writes, not a single thing with, that's been made was made without him. So the writer of Hebrews said that he made the universe. John said he made everything that was ever made. Then, verse 3, talking about Jesus, who being the brightness of his glory, whose glory? His Father's glory. Who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had himself purged our sins, that makes us know who it's talking about, it's talking about Jesus here. When he himself had purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Not a single prophet can have that said about him. None of that. Not a prophet made any world, let alone the universe. Not a prophet purged us from our sins and sat down next to the Father in heaven. That's Jesus. The prophets are great. Jesus is greater. Now, this Jesus who's greater radiates his Father's glory. Just like his Father, because he is God, Jesus is a light source. It's the difference between planets, moons, and stars. Stars don't reflect light, they are light. Planets, we can only see Venus, or how many line up every now and then together? Four or five of them or something? It's had enough time, all of them would, but usually it's just like three of them. So we have, if, if you include the downgraded one of Pluto, poor guy, uh, they downgraded him. But uh, we used to always talk about nine planets. Now we talk about eight major, and they call him a Pluto, a, a minor a, a dwarf planet. A what? A dwarf. A dwarf planet. So, how would you like that? That's not. That's not cool. Doing? Calling a planet a dwarf. <laughs> no. It's a little planet. We don't. 
We got little people. We don't got dwarfs. We got little people. We don't have little planets. We got, I mean, dwarf planets. We got little planets. But anyway, enough of my uh, admonition about wolf, being wolf. But uh, Jesus is just... It, it, what, what it says next year just blows me away. Uh, I, I can't, I try to imagine this. Well, I'll save it for what I, what, until I point it out. Uh, so he sits down on the right hand. Now, in the NIV, listen to what it says under verse 3. The sun is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being. That's why he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father sustaining all things by his powerful word. He made the universe. He didn't just make it, he sustains it. After he had provided purification for our sins, he sat down on the right hand of God. I put a verse, another verse in the New Testament down underneath there to verify what he said in verse three. Colossians 1.17. The New Living Translation is the rendering of this verse I put here, talking about Jesus. He existed before everything else began, and he holds all creation together. He didn't just create it out there. He's holding it in its place. We don't, well, we can't fathom what all that means. Hebrews 1, 3 said he does it by the power of his word. Here's the thing I was thinking. Did Jesus ever give that power up, that particular chore? When he was walking planet Earth, was he still holding everything together up there? The reason I ask that question, Philippians chapter 2 tells us about something theologians call the kenosis of Christ. And that's when Jesus though he was equal to God, humbled himself, stepped out of his glory in heaven, became a man, laid aside some, never laid aside who he was, but he laid aside some of the privileges of being who he was, of being God for a while. He wasn't sitting on a throne anymore. He was inside the womb of a woman. I can't wrap my brain around. From filling the universe. God is light. He fills the universe. Omnipresent. How many ever heard the term the omnipresence of God? It means he's everywhere. Is that part of the privilege he gave up? When he became man, did he quit filling the universe? Or is God so far more amazing than our mind can understand? that while he was developing a human body inside of a woman, he was still holding the universe together. I don't know the answer to that. He had a pretty good backup plan. If he laid that privilege aside, his father was there. His father would have simply taken it over. But God is so immensely big and I kind of got an idea when he was inside the womb of Mary, he was still manipulating our universe. Would that be something or what? Would that be something or what? But I'm going to tell you, however that plays out, I can't categorically say yes to that. But however that plays itself out as we get to heaven and understand things more fully, this much I know for certain. The kenosis of Christ is over. He's back at the right hand of the Father doing what he did before. So at this moment, Jesus is holding every bit of this universe in its place exactly where he wants it. When stars die and shoot through the space, most of them that we think are dying stars are probably just uh, asteroids or uh, meteorites. But nonetheless, if a star goes nova, 
and goes nowhere by the will of God. He is holding everything in its place. This universe is doing exactly what is commanded by the powerful word of Jesus to do. This isn't a fair argument. He's better than the angels. The angels can't do any of that. Look at verse 4. Being made so much better than the angels. Now that the author has established he's better than the prophets, he's going to move on to the angels. Being made so much better than the angels as he had by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. So, do you know that the Bible tells us that because of his obedience in, in Philippians chapter 2 again, that he has been given a name that's above every name. Not just the angel's name, every name. The Father gave him a name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue confess. Didn't do that for any angels. So he's so much greater. Now flip that page over to um, verse 5. For unto which of the angels, the author asked, said he at any time, that being God, unto which of the angels did God at any time say, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee, and again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. That's the quotation from the second Psalm, verse 7. I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day I have I begotten thee. He never said that about an angel. Now the son was there in the beginning. In the beginning was God. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. Jesus is not created. You say, how do you know that? I know that because there isn't anything that was made that was made without Him. He's part of the package that did the making or the creating. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, God, a conglomerate that we don't fully understand, a triune God made up of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost in a way that doesn't make sense to us down here. Our brains aren't quite big enough to understand it all yet. But I'm going to tell you something. Jesus did everything along with the Father. I envision it this way, and I'm probably a thousand times wrong. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. How did God do that? God the Father thought it. Jesus spoke it, and let there be. He's the Word of God. Genesis 1 said, and God said, let there be. God the Father thought it. God the Son spoke it. Then we see, and the Spirit moved upon the face of the waters, and the Holy Spirit activated things. So that's how I personally see creation working, in this triune God. What you can say about one, in many ways you can say about the other. In other words, there wasn't anything made that was made without the Holy Spirit. You can say that about the Holy Spirit, about the Father, about the Son, because they are God. And so they were all involved. And in Genesis, again, in the beginning, God, you can say there's the Father. And God said, Jesus is called the Word of God. There, we could argue, is the Son. And the Holy Spirit, in the Spirit, it said, moved upon the face of the water. There's God, the Holy Spirit. All three involved. And so that's the way I anticipated with, without board meetings. They didn't have to discuss nothing because they always thought the identical thing. Do you know when God decided to send Jesus to this planet to die for me? He didn't say, Jesus, come here. I got a proposition for you. Would you agree with me? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit never had an argument. They share the same thoughts. What one thinks, they all think. There's the connection we can't understand. So we just read what it says and go with that. So, look at verse... Um, by the way, Luke 135 is when the angel was telling 
uh, Mary what's going to happen. Um, that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Again, this is when Mary begets the Son of God, the Father said, I begot him. Won't ever say that about any of the angels. I created them. But I have something I did with the Son that's never been done before will never be done again. So, also verse 6, I got to run through these. He bringeth in the first begotten of the world. He says, but all the angels of God worship him. How much greater is Jesus than the angels? The angels are commanded to worship Jesus. Verse 7. And by the way, uh, that verse, according to Vincent, is nowhere to be found in the Old Testament. However, in the Greek Septuagint. The Septuagint, how many ever are familiar with the word Septuagint? The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. The New Testament's written in Greek. Alexander the Great conquered the whole then known world and mandated that everybody in his kingdom learn a simple form of Greek so soldiers could communicate with all of them. So by the time Jesus is born, even though the old Roman Empire is now uh, in charge, they too know some Greek. They didn't recreate the will. And so they can communicate with people around the world because of Greek. So the New Testament was not written in Hebrew like the Old Testament. It was written in Greek. And in Greek is what the Septuagint has written. They took the Hebrew Old Testament written in Hebrew and translated it into a document more people in the first century uh, in, the, in the area of the church age, when the church is being started, sometime before then, translated it into Greek. So the tep Septuagint is a Greek translation of the Old Hebrew Testament. So it's kind of odd that um, they can't find that exact verse in the Hebrew Old Testament, but they find it exactly stated that way in the Greek transliteration of the Old Hebrew Testament. So, anyway, now what's he say about angels? And the angels he says in verse 7, who maketh his angel spirits and his ministers flames of fire, but unto the Son, he says, thy throne, O God, forever and, is forever and ever, a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. So the angels, he says, you guys are ministers. And, uh, of flames of fire. You got this great ministry. But Jesus is something different than that. Verse 9, Thou hast loved righteousness, talking about Jesus, hated iniquity, therefore God, even thy God, has anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And again, quoting Psalm 45 and verse 10, And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hands, they shall perish, but thou remainest. The Father's talking to the Son there. The Son created. But then again, so did the Father. Uh, they sh your, what you created is going to perish, but you're going to remain. And they shall wax old, as does a garment. Verse 12. And as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. Everything God creates nowadays is aging. Even this world that it is said of heaven and earth shall pass away. Even this world is going to be folded up like a garment and changed into a brand new perfect reality. Uh, I personally, I can't prove this by scripture. It appears to me as common sense, but uh, that means nothing when you're interpreting scripture. Um, but I think this happens at the great white throne judgment when the planet is empty because everybody is up before the throne of God. When the planet's empty, the Bible said the earth, that's what I believe, the earth is going to be melted with fervent heat. If anybody was on the planet, they'd die. Uh, I think everybody's off the planet. Um, God's got other things for them to do right now, stand before his throne for judgment. 
and uh, the earth will be remade into a perfect, we don't even see the perfect earth at the beginning of the Old Testament. The earth was without form and void. It had to become perfect even back then. Uh, Kenneth J. Date believes that God created it perfect. He didn't create some formless void thing, but when Lucifer and his angels rebelled against God, Michael and his angels kicked him down to earth and it destroyed what was ever alive on earth at that time. And so, Kenneth J. Date, now a lot of people aren't real fond of some of his commentary, uh, but Kenneth J. Date believes that God created a perfect world. What we read about in Genesis 1 is him recreating the surface of the earth. The earth was already here. In the beginning, he created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. He didn't create on those first six days the earth. The earth was here. He's simply remaking everything. If indeed Finish J. Dake is right. If Dake is wrong, he simply created it without form to then begin to add all the things that made it beautiful uh, from days one to six. So we're not sure exactly uh, how that is. But anyway, so he's going to remain. Verse 13, but to which of the angels said he at any time, talking about God, sit in my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. Didn't say that about any angels. He said that about Jesus. In, uh, 100, I mean in a Psalm 110. And then in verse 14, the last verse of the first chapter, are they not all, talking about the angels, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? So the function of angels right now is to minister to you and me. This is where we get this idea of guardian angels. We don't understand the concept of guardian angels real well because Christians die in car accidents. Christians die of diseases. Christians die of all kinds of things. So somehow we have to mix different things in this. It isn't that the angels are sent to keep us alive and uh, perpetuity. That's a fun word to say. <laughs> I hear it a lot right now in Sean Hannity. They want a one-party system for perpetuity. Uh, isn't that a nice word? That's a fun word to say, Art. Perpetuity. <laughs> but that, that means forever. Forever, oh, forever and ever oh. and ever. Yeah. So, um, forever? That's not the angel's job. <laughs> I would get that the angel's job is when you're discouraged to breathe the word of God into your spirit as a believer that encourages you. In this case, the angel might have been using you to talk to your mother-in-law, to um, minister to your mother-in-law uh, in a time of discouragement. But that's what angels are, they're ministering spirit. So in closing, down here under verse 14, um, I made a question. What does the writer tell us about angels in chapter 1? And then you can see the verses where, where it says that they are inferior to Jesus, they are to worship Jesus, they are ministering spirit, they were never told to sit at God's right hand, they are ministers to God's people. What does the writer say about Jesus in chapter 1? You can see what verses there. God has spoken to us in the New Testament era through his son Jesus. He's the brightness of God's glory, the exact image of God's person. He holds the universe together by the power of his word. He purged our sin and sat down at God's right hand. He's better than the angels and has a better name than they do. He is God's son and the angels worship him. God the Father calls Jesus his son. What does that mean? Angels are great. Jesus is greater. Yeah.